My name is Kylie Rymanowitz. I work at Hatch Early Learning, and I'm joined today by Matt Nolan, my colleague, and we are really excited to talk to you about social-emotional executive functioning solutions for your early childhood program. It's something we're both really passionate about, and we have a super cool product to tell you about um, that can really be used as a tool in your classroom to help support early learning for young children. So we are here today to talk to you about Ignite Table by Hatch, which is a solution for early childhood programs with a ton of benefits for educators, helping to provide quality social emotional learning materials, capturing authentic work samples that you can use for your reporting, um, offering unbiased video documentation, and giving you access to standards aligned actionable data that can help validate your social emotional learning assessments. And we are really excited to talk to you about it today. So we're going to start with some brief introductions. I introduced myself a little bit, but my name's Kylie Raymanowitz, and I am the content manager at Hatch Early Learning. We are a company based out of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, but we kind of live everywhere. I live in Michigan, in East Lansing. I have my handy dandy trick where I can point out my hometown on my hand. I live right about here in the state of Michigan. Um, I started my early childhood career in the classroom teaching in a preschool for a couple of years. Um, that's when I decided I really loved teaching adults about kids. So I went back to grad school and since then I've done a little bit of everything in the early childhood world. Parent education, developing curriculum, and providing professional development for early childhood educators like yourself. Um, and while I'm at Hatch, I'm helping to design and create the content for our materials and our products that go into the hands of kids in your classrooms. And then I'll let Matt introduce himself. Hi, I'm Matt Nolan. I'm the senior product owner uh, for the Ignite table at Hatch. Um, I've been with Hatch for over 18 years now. Um, I was one of the first members of the product innovation department here, uh, and I've helped develop every single technology product that we've released over the last 15 years. Uh, my background is in art and then in computer science, so I have a, a nice mixture of the technical and the visual. Um, and while I was here, I discovered my passion for making a positive impact in this world uh, by enriching the lives of young kids through education, just like everybody here, I think, is, is really, truly passionate about. And I have been loving it ever since. Thanks so much, Matt. All right, so here's our presentation today. We're gonna to talk to you about social, emotional, and executive functioning solutions in the early childhood classroom. So our goals for today are to review social, emotional learning and executive functioning. Um, it's important that we start with a shared understanding, a shared definition of what that means. Then we're gonna talk about the importance of social and emotional learning and executive function in early childhood. Then we're going to explore the current needs of early childhood programs related to social emotional learning and executive functioning and potential solutions, including our Ignite Table product. So let's start by digging a little bit into social and emotional learning. And we're going to start by talking about theory. And you might go, oh, gosh, theory. I'm going back. I'm like back to the classroom. I promise I'm not going to give you a lecture on theory. We're going to talk really briefly about two early childhood theories that relate to the importance of social emotional learning, starting with, honestly, my favorite of all time, maybe Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you're not familiar, Abraham Maslow in 1943 developed this, one of the best known theories on motivation, his hierarchy of needs. Basically, he believed that people are motivated by their physiological and psychological needs. He organized these needs in this pyramid with our most basic needs at the bottom and our more complicated needs near the top. So you'll notice at the bottom of the pyramid, we have our physiological needs, water, food, breathing, shelter, and clothing. We need those things to survive. As you move up the pyramid, we have safety and security needs like health and wellness, physical safety or financial security, then social needs of love, acceptance and belonging, esteem needs like appreciation and respect. And then at the top, we have self-actualization. So room for personal growth and fulfilling your potential. Basically, his theory states that if our most basic needs aren't met, we can't focus our physical and, and psychological energy on building those more complicated needs. So if I am hungry, if I don't have enough food to eat, I'm not really focused on building my social needs like finding friendships or finding a partner because I'm really focused on survival at that point. So Maslow's theory relates to social emotional learning because it helps us in a couple of ways. First, we know that if we don't help children make sure that their most basic needs are met, they don't have the capacity to focus on those social needs. But we also know that those social needs, which can really be met by 
building and maintaining relationships with peers, with teachers, with other people as they get older, with friends, with partners, with teachers. Um, if we don't help them build those needs, they also kind of get stuck in the middle of this pyramid and they can't work on those higher level functioning. Um, we need social relationships to survive. We need them to thrive. And so if we can help children get those social needs met, we can help them move towards self-actualization. The second theory that we're going to talk about is Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. I'm not going to go through all of these because that would, again, be a lecture, and I promised I wasn't going to do that. But basically, Erickson believed that through different stages of our life, we have like a big conflict that we have to work through. So in infancy, our conflict is trust versus mistrust. We often say in early childhood, a baby's first job in the world is to determine if the world can be trusted. If I'm hungry, will somebody feed me? If I'm wet, will somebody change me? If I'm lonely, will somebody pay attention to me and love me? Um, we often refer to that as attachment. That's the outcome of trust, right? If I can trust the world, I can develop a secure attachment to the people around me. As children get older, they start to work on this conflict of autonomy versus shame and doubt. And as they get to preschool, they work on initiative versus guilt. During this stage, children are really practicing and playing around with exerting power in the relationships around them, which they often do through their social relationships. When they get to practice asserting power and control, they develop a sense of perfect, of uh, purpose, excuse me. So to resolve this conflict, children need to learn and practice skills for social and emotional development. This is part of their overall growth, and that can impact their other areas of development if they don't get the opportunity to really practice and hone those skills. So the reason we talked about this is that uh, Maslow and Erickson's theories demonstrate an intentional effort to build social emotional competencies in early childhood education is really necessary to support children in their overall development. Let's talk more specifically about what social emotional learning is. I'm going to abbreviate from now on in the presentation social emotional learning to SEL because it is a mouthful. It's a long phrase, but SEL is social emotional learning. Um, if you haven't heard of CASEL or the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, it's an amazing resource to learn more about SEL. Um, Castle.org is their website, and I, I really recommend you check it out. But they've really identified through a lot of research and from experts all around the world that social-emotional learning really consists of five main competencies. The first being self-awareness, so understanding your own thoughts, emotions, and values. Then there's self-management, so managing your emotions, your thoughts, and behaviors. What do I do when I'm angry? Can I stop myself from yelling at Matt when I think he made a mistake that made me angry? Then there's um, social awareness, so understanding the perspectives of others and empathizing with them. Next is relationship skills, so establishing and maintaining healthy and supportive relationships. And then the last competency is responsible decision making, so making constructive choices about personal behaviors and interactions. Um, you might look at this list and go, gosh, I need to practice some of these skills. Um, these are things we practice for a lifetime, right? But we can see how these are really important. Um, I want you to think about these, these five competencies. Think about somebody in your life doesn't have many of them or struggles with some of them and ask yourself, is that the person I really want to be around? Do I enjoy being around that person? Are they easy to work with or live with or live next to? Um, when people don't have these skills, it's really difficult to maintain those healthy relationships with them. We know that these skills help prepare us to have social relationships and to thrive, not just in our social relationships, but also in our other areas of development. So let's do a little practice. Um, I'm gonna give you a little scenario and walk you through how we see some of these social emotional competencies in this scenario. So you can see from my picture here, we've got an early childhood classroom. They're out at playtime outside. There are about four soccer balls and there are six or seven children and there's one goal. So children have a lot of opportunities to practice SEL competencies in this type of scenario, right? If a child sees someone sitting by themselves and asks, hey, do you wanna play soccer with us? That's practicing social awareness. I saw somebody else, I thought about their perspective, and I went and asked them if they wanted to play. If we see a child say to their friend, I'm really thinking about how I can kick the ball into the goal this time, that's self-awareness. I'm understanding my thoughts, I'm thinking about something. If two children are working on resolving a problem about taking turns or sharing a ball, 
That's building relationship skills. If a child really wants to steal the soccer ball from somebody else, but they stop themselves, that's an example of self-management. These are all things that happen every single day in your early childhood classroom. Whether or not we're seeing and recognizing them, children are practicing and working through these skills every day. So now that we've established a foundation for SEL, let's talk about executive functioning. Executive functioning and self-regulations are really mental processes that help us plan, focus our attention, remember instructions, juggle multiple tasks successfully. The brain needs a filter, basically, to help us prioritize, understand what needs to happen, set and achieve goals, and control our impulses. And the way it filters information is really through executive functioning and self-control. Now, you might think about these things, planning, focusing attention, and juggling multiple tasks, and think, gosh, the children in my classroom are truly terrible at all of these things. And yes, yes, they are, because children are born with the capacity, the ability to do these things, but they're not born with these skills. They're not innate. So what we need to do as adults and educators is give children the opportunities and the tools to practice and build these skills because we know that they don't have them on their own. And honestly, if you look at this and think, gosh, I'm not always good at these skills sometimes too, it is something we still practice and maybe struggle with as adults as well. So in order to practice and build skills for executive functioning, children have to master three main brain functions. The first being working memory, so retaining and using information over short periods of time. So that might be remembering that when it's time to eat lunch at school, I have to wash my hands first. We always wash our hands first before we sit at the table for lunch. Then there's mental flexibility. So shifting our attention in response to different demands. So if I'm playing and my teacher says, oh, Kylie, it's time for lunch. I have to shift my attention from playing, which is really fun, to going to wash my hands because I know that's the next step. Then there's self-control, so setting priorities and resisting impulses. So maybe I really want to sit down at the table first because it's chicken nugget day and chicken nuggets are my absolute favorite. And so I might have the impulse to elbow Matt away at the sink so that I can wash my hands first and get that first sweet chicken nugget, right? I have to control my impulses and be like, okay, no, I have to wait my turn. We wait in a line at school, right? So they have to have these three brain functions in order to really practice and build skills for executive functioning. Let's go through another example. Um, when you learn about executive function, people often use an analogy of an air traffic controller, which is a great analogy. But to be fully honest with you, I don't have a clue what an air traffic controller really does. I don't know anything about aviation except how to get on a plane. So I'm gonna use an example of making dinner because that's something almost everybody has done at least once. So I'm gonna walk you through making one of my favorite meals, which are barbecue power bowls. So in my house, this is one of our favorites, and I don't eat meat myself, but my partner eats pulled pork, and he likes pulled pork in these bowls. So because I don't eat meat, I make a big portion of pulled pork, and I freeze it in, in portions for these meals. So when I'm making this meal, I have to use my working memory to remember to get the pork out of the freezer the night before so that it has time to thaw for us to eat it. If I forget to do that, it makes it difficult to complete the task of eating dinner. I might also remember that, gosh, the last time I made guacamole for this bowl, I put way too much cilantro in it and it was a lot. So I need to dial back the cilantro for this time. I'm also gonna use my skills for mental flexibility because as I'm cooking the meal, I've got vegetables in the oven. I'm trying to make a slaw. I've got guacamole to make and I gotta heat up the pork and the beans. So I have to constantly be shifting my attention to what needs to happen next to make sure everything gets cooked at the same time and nothing gets burned or forgotten. And then I need to use my self-control. So when I'm making that guacamole, I am definitely gonna grab the tortilla chips from the pantry and try to eat it because guacamole is the best. But I'm gonna have to say, no, you have to control yourself so that you're hungry enough for dinner, first of all, and also that there's guacamole left for everybody to eat, right? So I have to also practice my self-control while I'm making dinner. We use these skills every single day and we also struggle with them sometimes, just like kids do. 
So let's go through an example involving a child here. So this is Mia. Mia is painting. A few minutes ago, she finished painting a picture of a dinosaur and she was using red and blue paint and she noticed that red and blue paint together turned her dinosaur purple. So while she's painting, if she wanted to draw purple flowers, and mixed red and blue paint because she remembered, that's what happened last time, she's practicing and using her skills for working memory. If she hears her teacher call, it's cleanup time, and she stops painting and puts the lid on her paints and puts the paint away, she's practicing mental flexibility. I have to shift my attention from one task to the next. If another child comes and steals that paintbrush right out of Mia's hand and she kind of wants to slug him, but she stops herself, that's her practicing self-control. I'm controlling my impulse of hitting another child, which often is kind of their first impulse when they're little. So that is executive functioning in action. Now that we've established kind of a foundational knowledge of executive functioning and SEL, let's talk about why it's so important. Um, so CASEL has done some really large scale reviews of SEL programs implemented in schools, and they found some really interesting and amazing results. Basically what they found is that children who were at schools that had SEL programs showed improved academic performance, improved social behaviors, they had lower levels of distress, they had improved attitudes, and they had decreased conduct problems. I would challenge you to find any teacher in the country, in the world, who would look at this list and say, I don't want these things for my students. <laughs> For any parent to say, I don't want these things for my kids, right? This is exactly what we want. We want them to be doing better in school. We want them to be happier. We want them to be less distressed. And we want them to be able to sit and focus on the learning when they're at school. The amazing part about these studies is that Castle found that they had long-term effects. So the effects of these SEL programs could be seen up to 18 years later. And they found an effectiveness across different cultural contexts. They found when, they, when you adjusted the program to fit the audience, to fit the diverse group of people that they were working with in specific areas, that they still had really positive effects. So um, SEL programs don't just work with one group of people or in one geographic area. So what are educators saying about SEL? They're saying, we know that SEL resources are critical post-pandemic. They're saying that we know that SEL has an, makes an impact and has positive outcomes for children. They also believe that having positive emotions and SEL skills are important for a child's academic success. In order for my students to su succeed academically, they need to have those skills to control their emotions as well. Now let's talk about why executive functioning is important. We know that when children have really good executive functioning skills and the tools to build those skills, we see school achievement. Kids can focus, they can sit, they can pay attention, they can follow directions, they can avoid distractions. We see positive behaviors. We see children showing leadership skills, making good decisions, being aware of the world around them, showing critical thinking. We also know that children with executive functioning skills have good health. They're making good choices about their health. They're making positive choices about nutrition and exercise. They're resisting the pressure to engage in risky behaviors like drug use. Um, and we also know that children who have executive functioning skills grow up to have successful work experiences. And I want you to also think here, who are the coworkers I love working with and think, do they have good executive functioning skills? The answer is probably yes, right? So people with executive functioning skills at work are better organized. They can help solve problems that require planning and they're prepared to adjust to changing circumstances. What do children need to develop these executive functioning skills if we know they're so important? They really need three things, and that sounds so easy, but it's much more difficult in practice. They need relationships. They need relationships with people in their lives. So in their immediate family, their caregivers maybe, but also at school with their teachers, they need those positive relationships. They need activities to build these skills where they can practice emotional, social, cognitive, and physical development in a way that helps them build these skills. And they need places. They need envir the environments where they spend most of their time to be safe and supportive so that they can build these skills. Ignite Table can help with activities that help children build both SEL and executive functioning capabilities. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Matt, who's going to do a walkthrough of our product and tell us about 
all of the cool things we've integrated that are um, helpful for teachers and for students. Awesome. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, I'm going to just take a few minutes to talk, tell you a little bit about uh, Ignite Table by Hatch, uh, which is our exciting new SEL product. And then I'm going to hand it back to Kylie for a little bit of work. Uh, Kylie, I think you might need to advance the slides because I'm not sure I have the power. There we go. Thank you. So I'm going to start by re reiterating those uh, problems we aim to solve that uh, we went that Kylie went over at the beginning of the slides with that purple slide we saw. Uh, so first is the need for quality engaging social emotional learning materials in the classroom. I mean, Kylie just did a terrific job explaining how critical SEL skill development is to a child's success in school and in life. So that was our starting point with this product. And true to our company's vision, we believe that technology solutions, when they're done right, can make a real difference in closing the skills gap for young children while they're still the most receptive of those changes, while their brains are still molded. Uh, the next issue we looked at, our next observation, is the lack of authentic work samples for supporting social emotional learning. Um, you and I know that it's really difficult to observe and record actual positive and negative examples of the full spectrum of SEL skills on demand when you need to pay attention to it, when you have the time to see it, especially when children's behavior often changes when somebody's watching them. So if they know they're being watched, a lot of times they're on their best behavior and they're not showing their true selves. So it's hard to get a true picture of exactly how well they actually are in the wild, if you will. Uh, next is the lack of documentation of peer interactions for all the kids in the class. So it's hard enough to gather SEL information for a handful of students, but capturing all the information you need for every child in the class becomes nearly an impossible mission. So you end up filling in the gaps with just your memories of what you might have seen in the last interactions with them. But it's hard to have physical documentation or notes that you took of every observation of every child in the class. Uh, the next problem we often see is boring games and activities that children don't enjoy playing. Um, this is where our years of developing technology products for early childhood really come in handy. Um, we know that a piece of technology that's designed to provide information on what a child knows can only be valuable if the children actually enjoy playing it. Uh, you have to strike a balance between the rigor and the fun because you end up with a tool that just never gets used if you don't have that. Uh, and lastly, the lack of standards-aligned actionable data to support the validation of SEL assessments. As you can probably attest to, uh, if you don't have authentic SEL work samples for every child aligned to the skills that you're required to measure, then it makes it very difficult to accurately inform those SEL assessments that you have to fill out. But more importantly, it makes it difficult to target the instructional areas that your children really need. So you really need that, that alignment. So that brings me to Ignite Table. So this is our next generation of SEL technology. It's replacing uh, We Play Smart by Hatch, which we developed in 2012. We've taken all those great experiences and feedback that we've received on We Play Smart, and we've poured it into Ignite Table. For children, it provides a variety of fun multiplayer games guided by our lovable hosts with customizable features, all on an exciting and unique piece of technology that they'll be really excited to interact with. For the educator, the games children are playing target a very robust and expanded set of SEL skills aligned to CASEL's SEL framework, as, as Kylie was mentioning, and an intentional focus on those executive functioning skills, as well as vocabulary development. So while the children are playing together, it automatically um, captures targeted authentic work samples in the form of recordings and also play data on how what children are doing. Finally, all that great information and those metrics can be accessed very conveniently from a website uh, called Insights by Hatch, which is our cloud-based reporting hub. So this allows you to spend less time administering those SEL assessments or setting a time aside time to try to focus on specific areas of the classroom uh, and more time focusing on teaching those specific SEL skills or executive function skills and nurturing them with the children. So next I'm gonna take you through the Ignite Table Child Journey. Uh, so, the child journey, so first off, just to set the stage for this, uh, so that I'm not talking over videos, which are very fun and engaging and exciting and difficult to listen while you're also watching them, I'm going to take a second here to walk you through the what and why that you're going to see, and then I'm going to give you a five to seven minute video to watch where you can watch uninterrupted of the actual experience that the child children see. So I'm going to start up here with the child login. So the child journey starts with our patented two-step authentic child login. So we know that a product designed to provide information 
about children starts with accurately identifying who is playing. So we have designed a proven method that strikes the right balance between that ease of use and accuracy. If children can't use it, they can't easily log in by themselves. That means teachers are going to constantly have to be facilitating that use. Um, and if it's not secure, then kids might accidentally log in as somebody else without meaning to. Uh, so the way that we've struck this balance is we've been actually using this in our other product called Ignite, uh, where each child will simply tap a go button on their hub. They'll find their picture from the full class set, and then they find their picture again, picture again from a smaller set, and then they're in. That's all that it takes. As an added ad benefit, uh, children who miss this initial login phase at the beginning can still log in later if there's available hubs to play at. The next step here is the goal selection. All the children will get an opportunity to see a little goal selection panel that pops up in front of them. Um, we found that providing a delightful and rewarding experience for children encourages this long-term and repeated engagement, which is really important so that they can experience the full breadth of skills that we have in this product. If they only check in at the beginning of the year, play a couple of games, and then check out because it wasn't entertaining, then you're not going to get that, that full breadth of skills that you really want them to, to see. So to that end, we've created a fun rocket ship motivation system that provides an opportunity for children to earn custom rocket ship parts while they play, and then they get to customize those rockets after they finish their play set. Those customized rocket ships show up as part of their hub and also show up as they transition from place to place. So they get to really feel engaged in the world that they're building. Next is experience vote. Now this feature is what determines what experiences or games the children will play. There's two parts to the feature. Uh, the first one is behind the scenes. And we've built an automatic and intelligent experience selection system, which is designed to evaluate what children have logged into play and determine the next three experiences that those children need in order to pr provide those work samples uh, in the back end. So which ones are most appropriate for that group of children? Now, once that's happened, the children get to negotiate and vote for what game they're going to play first. So this is their first taste of collaboration, and it kind of helps warm them up so that they get that, that feeling of, hey, I want to vote for this. I want to play this game first. Um, once they do that, we found that uh, research and our own experience shows that this bit of agency that we give over the children's experience, this, this control over their experience, really helps pull them in. So instead of just giving them a predefined set that they are forced to move through without any choice or control over it. Now, the one beautiful part about this is that there are no losers because they're, we've defined a three-game set. They're going to vote on the first game to play, but the second and third game are still going to be within the set. So if you, you didn't get your way and the other children outvoted you, you're still going to get to see that game that you wanted to see uh, in the next experience. Now the children are guided through the main part of the child journey, which is the three experience set, earning a star between each. Uh, the star tr tracker that you can see between each picture, first experience, second experience, and third experience, uh, is lets the children know how close they are to earning that rocket part. So keeping you know, a close eye on, and it lets the teacher know this as well, keeps a close eye on how close am I to the end of this set. In case they're starting to lose a little bit of energy with it, they can see, oh, just a little bit further, and I'll be getting that rocket part, and I can customize my rocket ship. Um, now, we designed the set to provide an appropriate amount of playtime in a single sitting, which is why we have three experiences. Um, and they're all aimed at about three to five minutes of time to play. Of course, it depends on the children who are, are playing it, but three to five minutes each. And the, the beautiful part about this is three separate experiences with three separate mechanics, all focused on very specific SEL skills really not helps match the children's um, attention span. So that three to five minutes of doing an activity is long enough to really get something valuable about it, but not so long that if the children is not super engaged with that mechanic or that particular skill, they're going to burn out and just walk off the table or, or lose it and start throwing a fit. So we, we built that very intentionally into this. Now, behind the scenes, we've enhanced the data collection. So now it's including participation indicators. So each hub has a little bit of an indication of whether the children that were standing at that hub were actually interacting with the games. So when we provide that information along with the play information and the video recording, you get a nice robust set of information about what was happening at the table. So after the three experience set, uh, you'll see we go to the rocket workshop after they've earned that third and final star. Uh, they earn that rocket part, and now they get to customize their rocket ship for a couple of minutes um, they get to choose what body, what fins, 
what rocket booster and the more they play the more parts that they earn to customize their rocket ship so that is the child journey now i'm going to show you a little bit of a video here so uh, i'm just going to be quiet and let the audio play I'm Toby the Robot. Touch a green button to take a rocket ride to the moon. Three, two, one, blast off! Hi there! Dr. Fismo, scientist and inventor extraordinaire. I built this rocket ship workshop here on the moon that will serve as our base as we explore our amazing world. Let's get started. While you're off exploring, I'll upgrade a part of your rocket. Pick a rocket part for me to work on. Let's pick the first two stops on your journey. Touch a circle to vote. The place with the most votes will be your first stop. Touch a circle to vote. All right, let's check out the first stop of your journey. practice is about to begin. Here comes the ball. First, we will practice passing the ball to the left. Watch out for Benny. He will try to block your passes. See how many times you can pass the ball around the circle to the left. Drag the ball with your finger in the direction you want it to go. the ball. need you to look after them while their parents are away. They're hungry. Check out 
astronaut friends are sleeping, we're going to pack their rocket ship with supplies they will need for their trip to outer space. The rocket hangar is a mess. We will need to move objects out of the way to find the supplies underneath. We're looking for food, water, sleeping bags, and toothbrushes. When you find a supply, touch it to send it to the rocket ship. The rocket ship is packed with supplies for the astronauts' trip to outer space. Thank you for helping me! That's it. I hope you guys are, are excited as we are to get this in, in the classrooms and get kids using it and, and building those great skills. Kylie, I'll send it back over to you. Thanks, Matt. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about how we integrated social emotional learning and executive functioning into the product. Um, this is the educational framework we developed for Ignite Table. It's based on a uh, Castle's five competencies that we talked about, relationship skills, social awareness, self-awareness, responsible decision-making, and self-management. And we also added unstructured play as one of our uh, domains as well. So we have games in all of these areas. And within each of these domains, we have different subdomains that are relevant. So for example, within um, social awareness, we have taking turns, understanding the basic needs of others, basic feelings of others, and acceptance of others. And then with each of these subdomains, we have three skill descriptors or skills that we're really allowing children to practice while playing those games. A sample breakdown for you. So within the domain of self-awareness, we have um, three subdomains of delaying gratification, identity, and understanding our own basic needs. And then with each of these subdomains, we have different skill descriptors that provide children opportunities to practice different skills within that, that major skill, that parent skill. So delaying gratification, they can practice delaying gratification during a group task and ignoring distractors while delaying gratification and identifying alternatives to keep busy while they're trying to delay gratification. So as Matt mentioned, um, during gameplay, uh, a recording of children playing is captured. And after uh, children play a game, information about that game is uploaded to our cloud-based reporting hub called Insights. Teachers can log into Insights and receive information about children's play experiences. So on this slide, you see just a screenshot of what uh, one screen might look like in our Insights reporting hub, where a teacher can see, oh, okay, so for a game about delaying gratification while completing a group task, I can see 
the recordings and access those recordings so I can watch and uh, see what happened during that gameplay. Now, to maximize the teacher's time, we don't record the whole game because you would never have time to watch all those recordings. So it's a maximum 45 second clip and we time those to happen during parts of gameplay where children should really be interacting with each other and practicing these skills. Um, we offer teachers an example of what it might look like if a child is uh, demonstrating the specific skill for this game. So for example, the child resists the impulse to take the immediate reward during a game. Um, and we also provide that data Matt mentioned earlier about whether or not a child participated. So we, we do collect some data that lets us know, yes, this child probably participated, or maybe this child logged in and then had to run to the bathroom. They didn't actually touch anything on the screen, so it's not likely that they actually participated in this game. Um, once a teacher logs in here, they can access the recording and then uh, collect some notes. So if they click on a recording, they're going to get a screen like this, which allows them to view the recording, watch what happened, and see those 45, up to 45 second clips. And then from there, they can start collecting some information that can be used to help validate their assessments. So they can indicate, did I observe this skill happening in the game from this child? Yes. They can also write some notes, like Tommy was doing a good job working on this. He's very good at delaying gratification. You can see this is just a sample with our text here. Um, and they can keep that information that they can then use uh, to share as anecdotal uh, information they can share with parents uh, during parent-teacher conferences or at the end of the day, or they can use that to help validate their particular assessments as well. So, Let's talk a little bit more about how Ignite Table supports social emotional learning and executive functioning. We're gonna dig into how these uh, important topics are really integrated into the product and we're integrated into the product from the initial thought to what we have now that we're releasing very soon. Um, so as we mentioned, every single game in Ignite Table is based on a specific social and emotional learning skill. Um, so this is a game called Pizza Train as an example. This is a social awareness game where the subdomain is taking turns and the skill descriptor is taking turns when prompted. So for example, in this game, children get to take turns putting toppings on a pizza. They have a little toppings train, then they can use that arrow to take turns and pass the train from one child to another. So everybody gets a chance to add toppings to that pizza. We also provide a lot of opportunities for social play during every single Ignite Table game. Um, opportunities for children to practice skills like coordinating, collaborating, communicating, and sharing materials. Children really have opportunities for both off-table social play and on-table social play. Off-table social play might look like a child saying, hey, Matt, you have to pass the, pass the toothbrush to me so I can give it to the Astro Cats so they can brush their teeth when they're in outer space. So I'm not actually interacting with Matt on the table in that moment, but we're practicing communicating and coordinating with each other. And we also provide lots of opportunities for children to practice on-table uh, social play. So that means passing a soccer ball back and forth or passing that topping train using the table to coordinate and collaborate with our peers. So when it comes to incorporating executive functioning skills, this was also on our minds through all the stages of the development of this product. Um, we integrated opportunities to practice seven really important executive functioning skills during gameplay in Ignite Table, including demonstrating self-control, the ability to persist, showing working memory, demonstrating flexible thinking, demonstrating planning, and demonstrating the ability to self-monitor, monitor, and maintaining focused attention. So I'll walk through a couple of samples of what that looks like during gameplay. I think I might have four in my slides here, but uh, for the sake of time, I think I might only go through three so that we have time for questions at the end. But for example, this is a game called Cupcake Chomper. I got to play this one for the first time this morning. It is so much fun. Um, this game is about delaying gratification. So as you can see in each child's little area, they have three cupcakes with some steam lines on top. They just came out of the oven and they are too hot to touch. So you can't feed them to the Cupcake Chomper just yet. So children are asked to wait. There's a little timer that pops up on the screen and they're asked to wait just a short time in order to touch those cupcakes and then feed them up the tube to the Cupcake Chomper. If a child touches a cupcake too early, it crumbles into crumbs and then they have one one less cupcake to give to the cupcake jumper. So children have the opportunity to practice the executive functioning skill of self-control during this game by trying to resist the temptation to touch the cupcakes before they're ready. 
Our next example is uh, an opportunity for children to practice persistence. So this game is called More S'mores. And in this game, children are tasked with making s'mores to feed all of their forest friends. And they each get their own little fire pit and their marshmallows are roasting there. You can see that one in the middle is just looking perfect and that's when it's ready to make a s'more. Um, so they have to go through the steps of making the s'more by touching on the marshmallow, putting all the pieces together, and then it gets swiped off the screen for an animal friend. But if they wait too long to touch a marshmallow, it might burn. So they have to keep going. This is a game with a lot of steps and a lot of things to remember. So we, we ask children to really practice this skill of managing all these steps at the same time and continuing to go on even if maybe they let a marshmallow or two burn along the way. Next up, we have an example of working memory. Um, this is one of my favorite games. It's called Our Garden. And in this game, children are growing their own little gardens. And we walk them through the steps of how to grow a vegetable or a fruit in the garden. First step is to use the shovel to dig a hole. Next step is to drop a seed into the hole. And then the final step is to use the watering can to water the seed so that the vegetable or fruit can grow. We walk them through each step of this process and then we give them some free play time where they have to remember what are the steps of the process. So that's working memory. Can I remember the order of the steps I need to follow in order to grow a vegetable or a fruit? So I actually do think I have time to go through this Next one briefly. Um, so I'm going to go through that because this is a really fun one too. Um, this is a game uh, about flexible thinking. And during this game, they're making cookie patterns. You can see each child has a little pastry box in their own little hub, their area. And they have to complete their cookie pattern and send that pastry box on its way. And they're going to pull those cookies from the conveyor belts you see on the screen in this little cookie factory. The problem is PJ the Fox can be a little sneaky and he tends to swipe the cookie that they might need to complete their pattern. So they might have this plan in place. All I need to do is grab that chocolate chip cookie and drag it in and I'm going to be able to complete my pattern. But when PJ steals that cookie, they have to use flexible thinking to go, oh, when he took the cookie I needed, what do I do next? What do I need to do to keep going and complete the task? So it's an amazing opportunity for them to practice some flexible thinking. We know that developing a product that helps support social emotional learning and executive functioning is really only the first step. Because if we develop a product and then don't prepare teachers or educators to use the product, it's not going to be very useful. So we're going to spend just a few minutes talking about how professional development really supports learning solutions. Um, we know that professional development can solve a lot of problems for teachers. It empowers teachers to integrate a learning solution or a program into their curriculum, their schedule, and their classroom in a personalized way that works well for them. Quality professional development ensures an effective and strategic use of early learning solutions instead of creating more work for teachers, which is the last thing any of us want to do. And we know that prepared teachers make for successful students. So we aim to really extend your impact on student outcomes. So not only have we created this product to support SEL and executive functioning, but we've created a three-part professional development plan that actually helps teachers integrate the product into their classrooms. So our professional development program for Ignite Table has three steps. The first is asynchronous learning. So educators get pre-recorded videos, which allow them to actively engage with Ignite Table's software and hardware and experience the digital experiences as young learners do, and then review other elements about the product. Once that part is completed, they move on to part two, which is a live virtual session with an expert trainer that walks them through a tour of insights, that cloud reporting hub, um, and other important features of the product. And the, the trainer here also helps them identify effective strategies for application and preparing to implement the, the product, the program, into their classroom. Part three is that knowledge check. So after completing the live virtual session, um, attendees receive an additional asynchronous recording that reinforces our data-driven practices at Hatch. And then teachers have an opportunity to exhibit the knowledge gained from the two previous trainings and formalize their next steps for actually using the product in their classrooms. So we've just walked you through an intense amount of information, and I'm sure that as we've been going on, there have been a ton of questions in the chat and that question box as well. It's been hard to keep up because there's so many of you chatting, but I'm going to pause here and see if, Akela, um, if there are any questions for us to answer, because um, we do have a few minutes to do so. We do have a couple. Um, I saw some comments on screen time and, and questions as well. So one of the questions was, 
Um, do you, you believe that too much screen time during early childhood is um, difficult for developing executive functioning skills? And adding on to that, is there a recommended screen time for this product? Yes. Two amazing questions. So first question, is too much screen time bad for executive functioning? I would say too much screen time is bad for all areas of child development. We know that children really need concrete learning experiences in real life. So we are an educational technology company, but not an ed tech company that says more screen time is better. We don't want kids to play this game for 40 hours a week because we know that wouldn't be good for their overall development. So it's important to have limits around technology in classrooms and at homes as well. So our recommended screen time for Ignite Table is 25 minutes per week. So the way that we've designed it, and Matt talked about our three game game set. So when children log in, they get a set of three games to play. Um, that ideally is so that it can be really integrated into your classroom's existing circle time routine. So just enough time for children to play at one center, the Ignite table could be a center, and then move on to a different area of the classroom as well. So we recommend only 25 minutes a week for this product so that it doesn't become overwhelming for children. Awesome. And another one was on the video aspect, um, getting parents' consent before recording a child. Is this recording kept in a database or is it only used for teachers and staff? Matt, do you know the answer to this one? Yeah, so it, it's a great question. Um, we do store this in a database, but we are highly security minded. So all of the child data is secure and not accessible to us or to anybody but those that are set up in the organization to access it. Um, awesome. And about about the other piece to that, which is getting video consent, um, I th generally speaking, it's I think it's a good idea as part of any practice where there's recording going on in the classroom to have video consent from the parents. So I would agree with that for for this case that video consent is a good idea, not not because we're sharing that video with anybody, but it would give your you more latitude to understand how you can use that video in your own program. Cool. Um, so uh, I have two questions and I'm going to merge together. What is the age range for the Ignite table and how many kids can play together at one time? Oh, also a great question. So we can have um, two to four children playing at the at a time. So if only two people log into the table, two children log in, they can play just the two of them. So we can have two, three, or four children playing at a time. And this is a preschool product. So we recommend this for children ages three to five. Um, and there are a lot of varied opportunities for children to practice really important skills for that developmental age. Awesome. And then it looks like there are a couple questions here on like special ed classes um, and how this incorporates into those classrooms. That is a little bit difficult to answer just because there could be a lot of variance in the type of classroom and the needs and abilities of children in that classroom. Um, I would recommend reaching out um, to Hatch to share maybe some specifics about your situation in order to answer that question. Um, but it's something, it's a tool that certainly can be used in special ed classrooms if the conditions are right for that to be effective. And let's walk through our end of the day housekeeping. These are just some references so that you have in, um, in the slides when you receive the information from today's presentation, some references that we used for you. Um, this is the contact information uh, for myself and Matt. If you have additional questions, don't forget you can join that Engaging Early Learners community with that website at the bottom here. And that's it. Um, thank you all so much for attending and participating. It's been lovely to talk to you today. And um, Matt and I would be happy to answer additional questions offline if you have any.